How's it going guys? It's Cole with See-Through Panel, and I'm going to be doing a top 10 list of the best comics I read in 2022. Uh, I'm not going to be including manga because I'm going to make that a focus of 2023, and I think uh, it's still a little early in my manga collecting and reading to do a list like that, and I probably will do a list partway through next year and probably at the end of next year. So there isn't actually any manga in this list, but I highly recommend that manga readers and manga enjoyers check out this video because it has some of the best non-manga comics that I've ever read in it. So this will be a top 10, but this video specifically will just be five of the of my favorite, and the next video will be the next five. Um, they're not in any real order. None of these are lower than the ones in the next video. I wouldn't want to put one above any others. Um, they're just all really awesome and very different. Um, good for very different reasons, as you'll definitely see. Obviously, I want to start with Urigal and Erm the Mad by Drie and Demuth. It is published by Titan Comics, and it retailed for $35 US. It is uh, one of the books in a long line of Titan Comics Drie collection. And the reason I'm including it is just because of this beautiful, beautiful artwork. I could have picked almost any of Drie's works a vertical spread can't fit that on the page we could have included almost any of Drie's works but this one is the one that really hit home to me it had such intricate geometry and architecture in the landscapes Lovecraftian themes which I I love all the time big Lovecraft fan and I think his rendering works best in this type of story for me um, unfortunately in this book there's a couple times I noticed the art quality is not as high as some other pages. Also very interesting layouts, like the most Drie layouts you're gonna get probably, maybe besides Gale. Um, but even though some of the pages have a lower, like it looks like a, honestly like a resolution problem, like they might not have the original art. Um, even though that's the case, it's just a really unique book. Even for Euro albums and stuff, this is just something you don't see this kind of format a lot of the time. Let's get this kind of spiral. Yeah, that guy's having a great time, look at him. Um, yeah, but this was a really phenomenal book. Definitely my favorite Drie book, but by a slim, slim margin. There's not, it's not like over and above everything he's done, it's just my personal favorite. I shouldn't linger too long on each book, I want to make this quick. That's the whole point of breaking it up into, into uh, two videos. Next, I'm going to do Defenders, because that seems like the most different from a Drie book. Uh, it's a Marvel book. I think it's the only Marvel book in the top ten. And was retailing for $16 US. You could probably still find it, because it's just a trade paperback. It's not a limited print run or anything. Or it is, but I mean, not to the extent of some hardcovers. Storytellers are Al Ewing and Javier Rodriguez, with Alvaro Lopez inking number one. Letters by Joe Caramagna. And it was, I did a video on this one and Urigal, obviously, and one other book in this list. It was phenomenal big two work. It's something you don't really see every every year is just big two work that transcends the medium in the way that this book did. It's full of Marvel history, but you don't need to know any of that stuff going in. I'm not a big continuity guy, and I still enjoyed it a ton. The art is killer. The layouts are fantastic. Rodriguez colors himself, I believe. I didn't mention a colorist there, no. He colors himself, and he kills at it. You've got this three-color comic kind of theme going through the whole thing. It's going to reoccur. The imagery of that kind of meta-narrative gets very cool towards the middle and the later halves. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, on the whole, probably the best uh, work from DC or Marvel I read this year. There was another four issue miniseries called Defenders Beyond that I read digitally and it it holds that same level of quality for another four issues and makes me so happy that stuff like this exists and I'll get to just some more of the melding of the three colors again magenta cyan and yellow are recurring a lot in this book I think it's yeah like here and then yeah it's it's a deep, deep book. Al Ewing actually had a post on his blog about um, about this series and all the like meta narrative and 
the themes going through it and all the things that inspired him and that he looked to while creating this. And it's crazy, and I don't understand the half of it, but I still love it, and it still feels um, very authentic to me and just full of passion for the medium and the history of American comics because to do something, something like this with this depth at Marvel, you have to really have a love for the kind of comics that Marvel publishes. So he clearly does. He's a big continuity guy. I am not, but it still works very well for me. Check out the second series, Defenders Beyond. It's going to be coming out, I believe, early next year, either February or February, maybe, or maybe a year, month after that. Azimut by Wilfred Lupano and John Baptiste Andrea, published by Statics Press from Titan Comics, retailing for $40 US. Nice hardcover. I did a video on this as well. This was the final book in this list of five that I actually did a video on. Uh, it just so happens that the stuff I do video videos on is the stuff I really like, so obviously it's going to be in my top list. I do cover these in depth, much more in depth in those videos. So this book is just a trip, an absolute trip of a story with very uh, unique pacing and uh, the way it conveys its its message is very strange and odd and I love that about it. It's very quirky and very, um, I don't want to say too much about the ending actually. I was about to spoil some stuff there. It's very, very uh, unique in its storytelling. I'll just say that. And the way it unfolds, you'll never, ever guess. Uh, you, you, you know what the characters want, but you never know how they're going to get there. And just some bizarre, bizarre imagery. Some bizarre story choices. Um, I don't love everything about it. I talk about that in my video. But I do love the majority of it. The art is incredible by Jean-Baptiste Andrea. It is, I mean, I have not seen work of this quality. I mean, it's it's up there with definitely my top art of all time. It's got a realistic style to it with very cartoonish renderings of the characters and very expressive renderings of those characters. But in the detail of the landscapes and the machinery and the architecture, very realistic. The coloring is wonderful. I believe he also does the colors, if I'm not mistaken. And it is truly a adventure book. They go from many different countries and lands, exploring many different areas, cities, beasts. And it's just, it is a wonderful, wonderful book. I would recommend it to anybody that is, uh... oh wow, this scene was wonderful. The use of color in this is great too. Yeah, I would recommend this to just about anybody, honestly. If you're not uh, looking for a super tightly uh, tightly paced and focused story, you're ready for a little bit of meandering and wiggle room in the story to actually change and evolve, that's, that's what that story is all about. So up next, Ice Cream Man Sunday Edition Volume 1 from Image Comics, retailing for $45 US. Nice production. Really weird, like shiny blue that I've never seen before and nice little raised lettering there and spot varnish and all that. So a nice production from Image. I believe it is a sewn binding. It is in fact a sewn binding. If I could get this up for the camera. So that's always great. I hate to get a hardcover and have it be glued. Nice end papers. Really a lot of design. This is like double end papers which I was confused about. Written by W. Maxwell Prince. Illustrated by Martin Morazzo, colored by Chris O'Halloran, lettered by Good Old Neon, and designed by Akko Studio. Um, and what I love is that it's always written, colored, and illustrated by the same people. And that is very attractive when it comes to American comics. Um, it's image, so you don't expect a lot of changes like you would at Marvel or DC, but still, not even a fill-in issue. They are just consistent, and they come out so frequently. It is a, it is a horror book which I've been trying to collect a lot more of, but it is different in the sense that it is an existential horror book. Not a lot of gross out, some. Not a lot of um, jump scares or things lurking in the night or monsters or uh, demons, ghosts, whatever you want from the horror genre. It's, it's just about how sad and horrific life is. There are some 
over-the-top um, fantastical bits, and there is an underlying thread through the basically anthology series. But those things are icing on the cake, or uh, sprinkles on the sundae, I suppose. They are not necessary, just a little added bonus. This guy is a recurring character, and although he is in most issues, it is very much an anthology story told by two fantastic creators who are very at home in this genre. Uh, Murata's art is... The coloring can be bright and vivid, but the facial expressions and the perspectives and the pacing of it all just feels detached and feels strange. And even when his characters look happy, they look almost a little bit deranged. Uh, yeah, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Still going. I'm going to love to collect each hardcover as they come out. Um, sometimes there's little intermissions where you get some of the recurring characters to come out and it appears that maybe that's the main through line, a main story, but I think that's actually the B story. The A story is just this horrific anthology. This one issue is just uh, what a, a man's thoughts as he's jumped off the top of a skyscraper and is falling. There he is. And everything he thinks about... See, there's some, there's some gross out. Everything he thinks about continually as he falls. And yeah, it's, it's a crazy, crazy anthology series, but it's just so wonderful and always feels very true to itself. Uh, maybe not every issue is going to ring true for you, but that's an anthology. That's how they always work. At least here you know what you're getting in terms of writer and artist. Not all anthologies, you could say that. So, my favorite horror comic of the year, for sure. Um, Snow Glass Apples by Neil Gaiman and Colleen Doran, published by Dark Horse Comics, an adaptation of the short story, and $18 US. Like I said, I think this is, yeah, a retelling of a Neil Gaiman work. Adaptation and art by Colleen Doran, lettering by Todd Klein, and end papers are really pretty cover obviously it's a strange reversal of the typical trend i think the cover is less detailed than the interior art i think it's actually lying about the art but in the reverse of the usual sense uh it is a book that is so intricately detailed that it almost hurts my hands thinking about how colleen doran had to draw all this God, it's just there's so much going on. It's almost interesting to see this layer of the bodies because there's not as many lines on it. And it's just contradictory to every other part of the page. Even a little trail of dust is like, or the trail of smoke is as many, as many lines as you'd see on a page of comics. Even the leaves, I'll have to turn the book, but. Ridiculous, ridiculous. I mean, there's not much for me to talk about here. It's a very short story, so I don't really want to get into the story at all. Um, I do love the story. I love Neil Gaiman, but I'm here for this art. Just to be true to you, it's a fantastic story. It's really good, but I'm here for the art and just looking at all these textures and patterns, colors as well. Colleen Doran does the colors herself, right? I already forgot. Yeah, the only person touching this besides Colleen Doran is Todd Klein. Because she's adapting it, so Neil Gaiman doesn't come in and write new stuff or anything. She just adapts it, scripts it, I imagine. Klein comes in to do the letters. Yeah. It is a short story, but it really feels like there's a lot packed in here. I also love the layouts. Um, it's almost like a DeLuca effect, where there's no breaks in panels, and there's consistent character movement. But it's, it's not really... It's more just... Um, sections of the page being different panels. I don't know how to describe that. Coloring is gorgeous here, like a sunset in the dress. Look at all that, too. Just a minor, minor part of the page. I probably forgot uh, in the beginning of this to talk about how these aren't comics that came out in 2022. These are just comics that I read in 2022. That's a huge part of that that I did not talk about. That's all right. This is ridiculous. I 
I may cover this and a couple of Colleen Doran's other books in a video sometime because they're all just so wonderful. Chivalry, which is also an adaptation of a Neil Gaiman short story or novella, maybe, um, is is written and adapted, or sorry, drawn and adapted by her, and it's gorgeous in a different kind of way than this. Um, yeah, so that's about it. So these are the best five of the best things that I read this year, and I hope you check them out if you haven't already. If you haven't seen my videos for Irigal, Azimut, or The Defenders, check them out because I go a lot deeper. And I was had the stories more fresh in my mind at that time. I didn't reread much of these, some, a little bits of some of them for this video, but obviously you'll get a deeper dive into those uh, in the individual videos. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I really, really appreciate everyone who's been subscribing and watching. I've gone up by a lot of subscribers and view count in general in the last month or so, and I really appreciate you guys for that. I'm hoping to uh, elevate the videos that I make in 2023 and put a little bit more work into it, get a little bit more consistent. So really appreciate you guys watching. Have a good one. Peace.